ketogenic diet and training, whether it be aerobic conditioning, whether it be anaerobic training, muscle building, bodybuilding, CrossFit, uh, hybrid, high intensity interval training, there, there is an answer for just about every kind of training. And you know, with me, I have Dr. Dom D'Agostino, and then I have uh, Connor Young, who's the CEO of Ample, who's been on our channel before. That brand has been on our channel before, so you might recognize that name. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have a discussion, and, and Connor's going to bring up some, some good questions and really about our training philosophy, Do, uh, Dominic's training philosophy, my training philosophy. So, Dom, I'll kind of let you open a little bit on your training philosophy first and then kind of get into some questions. Yeah, um, my training philosophy now, as it was in the past, is just like very heavy power bodybuilding, as you'd call it, you know, compound movements, deadlift, squats, bench, and a periodized uh, routine, which I did and probably put on most of my size and mass, not on a ketogenic diet, but on more of a moderate carb diet, you know, in my teens and early 20s. And, uh, and really just I never kept my workouts longer than 30 minutes, maybe 45 minutes or the longest. But warm up, super high intensity, followed like the Dorian Yates, uh, Mike Mentzer heavy duty style training. And this worked really well when I was in college working couple jobs and taking a heavy course load and uh, and found it very effective for putting on size and strength. Awesome. Yep. And just kind of, I fall back to that training style, you know, uh, now just as more of a, uh, it's very logistically <laughs> feasible when you're uh, juggling a bunch of things in academia and working long hours. So I can squeeze in a workout in 15 minutes with that kind of training. Yeah. Yep. Yours is very dissimilar to that, right? Like you started as like a marathoner when you were 11. What's your, what was your kind of? Yeah, it was, my foundation was much more uh, endurance based, which is interesting. We've talked about that, like from an epigenetic standpoint that, uh, so I mean, I, yeah, I ran my first marathon when I was 11. Uh, I think I ran my first 10K when I was five and a half or maybe five and six, you know, so I, I That's really insane. started at a very young age. It's probably why I'm short, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I'm not that short, but uh, shorter than people think I am. Uh, anyway, so yeah, so I mean, I really built that foundation with a lot of that. And then I did a lot of body weight stuff when I was uh, running a lot. Like I definitely like built, I could do a lot of pushups. You know, I was definitely like could crank out like 150 pushups when I was, but I was also like 140, 150 pounds. Uh, then I started to beat up my knees quite a bit from doing so much running and I found lifting and I really got excited about it, really liked it. And uh, then that kind of opens up a whole new can of worms. I, I went way overboard, went on a bulk gone wrong and then stopped training, ended up a little over 300 pounds and sedentary. And so I had a lot of like mass underneath me and then trimmed that all down. And then now my training philosophy is much more uh, kind of a hybrid. I, I do a lot of endurance work, but I do a lot of obviously strength training work, but the strength training work is kind of there to just maintain my mass more so than trying to have any specific like muscle goals. Mm -hmm. I want to maintain my mass while I do as much uh, endurance work as I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what's interesting to me, I, I kind, of, kind of come from a CrossFit background, like I, I did tennis and sports throughout high school and really got into CrossFit and, and some of those, you just high intensity interval with a lot of power-based Olympic lifting, and then also some actual power, uh, power lifting as well. And so when I talk to people about keto, you know, in that community, they're always like, yeah, it works well for like the runners and stuff, but like, you can't actually, like, you just need, you just eat up too much glycogen in those types of uh, workouts. Can you guys speak to glycogen in those types of like Metcon, so to speak? <laughs> My workouts are not long enough to actually tap into my glycogen <laughs> stores. Sure. I, I literally, uh, you know, I don't know. We trained today and that was a super long version. We trained today and yesterday and that was quite a bit longer than what we normally do. And we can describe our workout later. But uh, my typical workout is if I'm going to deadlift, I will do warm up, you know, 135, 225, 315 or 405. And then I'll jump to like six plates and pull that for my work set and then then I'm done. And I just, in my notebook, I write in one set of deadlifts. I don't even count the, you know, because my, my warm ups are pretty quick, like, you know, just a few seconds, however long it takes me to put on another plate and then I didn't do another warm up. But that like describes a whole workout that I would do and I'm not depleting glycogen during that. And I noticed that, and I've even noticed, you know, with a prolonged fast, three to five to seven days, that my strength in that kind of workout is not really altered that much yeah. at all. It, maybe it would be in a pressing movement, 
you know, where you don't have the uh, intra cellular leverage associated with just the fluid you know retention if you're carved up and you're kind of bloated on carbs <laughs> just you know with keto you do run a little bit dry overall it has a diuretic and a naturetic effect you excrete more sodium and stuff so that's why i mean we incorporate electrolytes into our our routine quite a bit more <laughs> yeah. than average so yeah and with the glycogen piece i mean i can like my training is generally okay i've got a wide spectrum of longer distance running. Uh, you know, right now, I'm not. Right now, I'm not doing much more than like seven, eight at a time. You know, but you know, there are times when, you know, I'm I'm running 16 miles, 18 miles every other day. You know, like really cranking the mileage up. Um, and I've never had a problem with like my my strength diminishing. I've never, but to the glycogen thing, you know, I mean, there's there's a fair bit of research that shows that like the, the more fat adapted you get, the more longer you're on a ketogenic diet you become much more efficient at retaining glycogen and storing mm -hmm. glycogen. What is it, the Volick study that was you know, pretty well known. It yeah. takes a look at you know, uh, ultra runners and things. It, basically, they, they go through about the same amount of glycogen as a car burner mm -hmm. you know, once you're adapted. So it's really six in one, half a dozen in the other. The body becomes really efficient at restoring glycogen very fast. Um, you know, I think that there's some potential cause for like say, or actually application for having some carbs like pre-workout if you really wanted that extra push. But <clears throat> for the high intensity interval work, I don't feel like I'm really depriving myself of much. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think I could probably safely say I take maybe a 5% hit you know, yeah. on, on my energy when I'm deep keto. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense. I mean, I feel like a lot of people, they over index on carbs. They say, well, like keto is not the thing. So then I'm going to just go like the exact opposite direction. And, and for me, I'm kind of feeling like both there's a happy medium there, but also it also seems like keto is in a way it's a met it's a metabolic state rather than a diet and so if you mm -hmm. just if you if you're just trying to go for your 30 grams of carbs or whatever well you might that might not actually be what you need but instead going for the fact that you're still in ketosis even though you may be consuming something more like 60 70 grams of carbs mm -hmm. how do you feel about like you know carb like modulating and how do you help people modulate how much carbs fit for them, work for them on their ketogenic diet? You want to answer that one? Uh, yeah, it depends on the goal. So my general recommendation for a ketogenic diet, if someone's going to use it in the fitness world, is to, uh, it, the ketogenic diet really shines in the context of trying to lose weight or trying to promote body composition alterations, like if you're in the fitness world, you know, and you're a fitness a athlete. Uh, or if you're a wrestler or if you're an athlete that needs to make weight, I think there are significant advantages with the ketogenic diet because it's protein sparing and uh, it allows you to create a caloric deficit, preserve muscle and retain strength and performance. My opinion is that it can do that better than a standard bodybuilding type mm -hmm. diet. So. I think it works, people may argue that, but I, I really believe that the data is supportive of the ketogenic diet, not, not for building muscle, but for preserving muscle and strength and body composition, primarily for more fat loss. Uh, and it seems like most of the people are trying to do that, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you're either bulking or you're doing a recomp and you're trying to, and some people are just in maintenance mode and I prefer to use it also in just in preserving muscle and strength and if I want to gain strength, what I do is I back off on the fats a little bit and increase my protein from, say, 1.5 grams to, per kilogram to upwards of 2 grams per kilogram. So I'm 100 kilograms, so about 200 grams of protein a day. Mm -hmm. I'll bump it up. And then I can see the scale start moving in terms, and I can see the weights you know, start to go up over time. So, but it's not probably an ideal approach for, there's a lot of people out there probably just looking to gain size and strength. Uh, I do not, and I did not, you know, I maintained a certain level of, of body weight, 230, 240 pounds. Now I just cruise it less, like 215, 220. And it's, I can just, uh, I don't have to force feed myself. I can eat two or three meals a day, sometimes one meal a day and preserve it. It's a lot easier to maintain muscle with the ketogenic diet. But if I was younger and much more carb tolerant and wanted to build muscle, I think I would, I would put carbs back into my diet, but I wouldn't be eating 
like I did in the past when I was younger, three, four, five, six hundred grams of carbs a day, I think you can really build muscle with 150 grams of carbs mm -hmm. or 200 grams of carbs a day. Mm -hmm. Now today's video is sponsored by a company called ButcherBox. They are a really cool grass-fed, grass-finished beef delivery company. They don't just have beef, they have chicken, they have fish, they have shellfish, scallops, they have chicken thigh, they have brisket, they have everything you would think of. Super high quality, delivered to your doorstep. Honestly, their ribeyes are the best ribeyes I've probably ever had. And I've had a lot of really good ribeyes. So that link is down below. So if you're finding ways to get new protein in, finding ways to get your meat in, try and find ways that are gonna, I don't know, spice up your diet a little bit, check them out. And then it's delivered to your doorstep in just a couple of days, super easy. And if you like scallops, I'm telling you right now, their scallops are some of the best scallops I've ever had as well. So that is right there down below in the description. That is a special link that'll get you access to ButcherBox. They've been a big supporter on this channel for a while. So check them out after this video. Get your hands on some of that. Seriously, it's epic. Yeah, it's, you know, generally for me, like when I cycle off of keto and go through a period of time when I'm having more carbs, even then it's, it's not really north of 100. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's still very, very low carb and it's very much allocated very specific times, um, you know, for me, like generally immediately post-workout and then generally at night to help me sleep, you know, uh, with the occasional carbs pre-workout just for something different, just to try to like get a just different response when I'm training. Um, you know, in your question, like how to determine how many carbs for someone to have, I think that's really, that is highly individual. Mm -hmm. It all depends on, you know, their glucose sink, the amount of muscle they have, which, you know, a glucose sink of how much is that glucose is going to get, you know, sucked up into the muscle. You know, mm -hmm. someone that has, you know, a X amount of lean mass versus someone that has Y amount of lean mass, you know, the person with a lot more lean mass is going to simply be able to tolerate a lot more carbs because it's going to, you know, translate into more glycogen, right? So that really factors in. So if I were to have to look at someone and say, well, how many carbs do you have before it kicks you out of ketosis? I mean, that way you just have to measure, you just have to track, you know, that's the only way that you're really going to find that. Uh, and I have found the more fat adapted I am, the longer that I've been in ketosis mm -hmm. for over, over a decade, um, or practicing a ketogenic diet intermittently, I should say, for over a decade, then uh, yeah, I find that I can get away with more carbs because I think my body, I think my body, I should say, uh, you know, make that very clear, preferentially wants the fat. I think it's given it so much of that that it's just leaning towards that more. Okay. So the carbs almost become an anomaly where it's just kind of like, uh, let's just deal with this and burn it and get it out of here or store it or whatever and get this guy back to burning fats because that's what we're used to. Yeah. And that's kind of what it feels like and what it looks like. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I'm wondering as well, you know, you guys are talking about some of the uh, interesting effects of, of ketogenic diet, i.e. the protein sparing effects. Mm -hmm. And so what I also think about is, is the inflammatory effects or the mm -hmm. anti-inflammatory mm -hmm. effects. Yeah. And I think about it, like some of these very, very high level athletes, for them, it's less about actually building muscle, it's actually more about recovering quickly yeah. from workouts. Can you speak to workout recovery on a ketogenic diet? Yeah, very good point. I think um, in speaking with Jeff Bolick, he had brought this up to me. This point up to me, when I was studying ketogenic diet primarily as an, a neuroprotective anti-seizure strategy for our research, and I wasn't even at the time not even that much aware of his research, and when I connected with him, uh, he sort of really enlightened me on this idea of a ketogenic diet that uh, the ketogenic diet was promoting recovery and could allow athletes to run marathons like day in and day out, mm -hmm. sometimes back to back. So when we exercise, that creates a massive reactive oxygen species load throughout our body. And the formation of you know, superoxide anion and then hydroxyl radical and other reactive intermediates can create systemic inflammation. That systemic inflammation, uh, there's a period of inflammation that's associated with the adaptive response to recovery right, and, and remodeling. And that's important actually when you strength train. But prolonged inflammation can impair recovery. And with the ketogenic diet, some of the first experiments that we did is simply just putting ketones into uh, a neuronal medium, artificial cerebrospinal fluid, and, or various cell types, and seeing a, a really marked reduction in reactive oxygen species mm. production. 
you know, under in the context of certain environmental stressors. Mm -hmm. So that that's kind of what we study. And the same thing go, is going on, I think, in athletes is that you're attenuating, not abolishing, but attenuating that burst in reactive oxygen species mm -hmm. that can be counterproductive in terms of uh, being pro-inflammatory and that can mit mitigate some of the adaptive responses associated with recovery. So I think uh, attenuating that response actually allows the body to adapt better in, in regards to recovery, especially in the context of endurance athletes that are really pushing their bodies and getting this massive oxidative stress signal because they're pushing their mitochondria to generate so much ATP and mm -hmm. just shuttling so much so many calories and so much energy through their their system through their metabolism that as a consequence you generate more reactive oxygen species which then creates more inflammation uh, when you're in a state of ketosis that's significantly attenuated mm. so we know that from a variety of different model systems from the cell to animal models to humans that you can attenuate that that reactive oxygen species induced inflammation which could be impairing uh, exercise recovery. And is that sort of depend, no matter if it's aerobic or anaerobic or, you know, type? <laughs> yeah. Good question. I think, you know, I think it applies more to the endurance athlete that's really doing that prolonged exercise and just really using a massive amount of energy and then therefore creating a lot more oxidative stress. But probably also the strength athlete who has longer than normal workouts. So, Probably, although I would say even from the perspective of doing strength training and keeping my workout short, I do notice that when I'm in a state of ketosis, I am, I don't have as much DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness, <laughs> the days following, that if I, if I revert back to an occasional experiment with carbs, that it seems to exacerbate that delayed onset muscle soreness. You know, uh, so when I'm in a state of ketosis and if I'm in also in a calorie deficit too, uh, for some people that may impair recovery, but I noticed that if I'm doing a ketogenic diet and doing a mild calorie deficit, my recovery is actually better. I have less inflammation and soreness yeah. the days following. I think the operative word there is mild calorie deficit. So yes, yes, yes. I yeah. definitely find yeah. when I... It could be the opposite when you restrict too much. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely find on like a day when I'm intermittent fasting and doing a longer fast, occasionally I'll throw a really tough workout into a fast just because I'm maybe masochistic, I don't know. but. <laughs> And I find that my, my recovery is, is squashed. It yeah, definitely is, yeah. you know, and it, there's, there's no denying that. I've seen it time and time again with myself. Yeah. But it, the question that comes to mind with me is, uh, you know, a certain inflammatory response is obviously key for recovery too. So the ketogenic diet isn't modulating inflammation so much to a point that it's inhibiting recovery, right? Uh, no, no, it's not like a scenario where, you know, if you're loading up on non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like NSAIDs. Yeah, post-workout can actually. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So taking NSAIDs, and which many people do because they have different injuries like knees mm -hmm. and things like that, and they want to attenuate that pain so they can train stronger. Uh, or train train heavier. Um, I think it, it's not you know it's not a big hammer. So what it is doing is sort of correcting the overproduction of oxygen free radicals and also uh, inflammatory uh, cytokines and chemokines okay. that could then persist for hours or days after the workout, and then that could inflammation can trigger the adaptive response and remodeling in the muscle. So you don't want to squash that with like lots of ibuprofen or naproxen sodium or something like that. But with a ketogenic diet, it's not, it's not abolishing that, but it's attenuating the overproduction, I think, in many ways for, especially those super hard workouts where you are really adding, you know, fuel to the fire of inflammation. Yeah. I think it can really help with that. For me, I have definitely, I mean, a, a good, Example of that is that we do a lot of cytokine measurements and uh, using Eve technologies and we're measuring these things in people right now, but uh, a good marker, and we talked about this a little bit with biomarkers, is high sensitivity C-reactive protein. And mine was always hovered around one to 1.5, but since I've been keto and especially incorporating uh, intermittent fasting too, it's like 0 0.1, a maximum of 0 0.2, or it comes back NS, which is uh, not even uh, measurable, so <laughs> not significant. So uh, my my overall, a good marker of systemic inflammation is high sensitivity C-reactive protein, and that's a good index. And it's like 
I have taken blood after a heavy deadlift or squat workout and it still doesn't even move the needle on HSCRP mm. so when I'm in a state of ketosis. So that has been a big, my knees feel so much better, everything just feels so much better if I just maintain the state of, and it's not clinical ketosis, it's just I keep in a mild state of ketosis, like you know, one to 1 1.5 uh, millimolar or breath, breath acetone of about 10 to 15 uh, ACEs with a biosensimeter. So. And when it comes down to, like I've noticed, uh, with more max lifts, uh, I, I've talked to a lot of power lifters that have been concerned about keto. They, they really, uh, it's kind of funny, by nature of the beast, power lifters are very experimental people. And I've noticed that a lot of them, like Mark Bell, guys like that, uh, a lot of good friends, people that I know that are power lifters, they're very experimental, very curious about it. And that's what I appreciate. Like they don't typically take, uh, well, sometimes they take hard stances, but they're very, so I have had a lot that have approached me and are very interested yeah. in keto. And then when they do it, they find that their max lifts don't change a ton. And I've chalked it up some to some degree, like for, for one rep max type stuff, like it's a little bit like regardless of the situation, you're running mainly on a CP system, which is kind of going to be regardless of ketones or carbs, it's kind of an independent pathway anyway. Yeah, yeah. So if they're really going for a max lift, um, but I mean, the CP system, the creatine phosphate, that's only gonna that's only gonna drive you for what, like a half a rep or a rep, right? Like nothing really more than that, maybe two reps? Grind out a rep or two, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I noticed that I ran out, my supply chain ran out for the brand I was getting. So I went a couple, like maybe two months without creatine and added it back in and noticed I got an, an extra two reps back, you know, on my Interesting. best set of bench. Uh, but our natural stores maybe drive, yeah, what, yeah, yeah. a rep? Yeah, yeah is that, real, okay. yep, yep, yep. 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 <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I do think that there is some advantage, for example, if you're going into like a pressing workout to like, you know, maybe even load up on carbs and sodium and water right before that, because the expansion in the water retention gives you more intracellular leverage, you yeah. know, in pressing. But when it comes to like deadlifts or squats, actually, I feel better. I've been stronger. I feel the ketogenic diet significantly aids in enhancing that power to weight ratio. So only when I started doing low carb and keto was my deadlift went down, my, my total deadlift numbers, but I was deadlifting far more from, for my body weight. So I could deadlift three times my body weight for reps and I couldn't do that when I was on a carb-based diet when I was my biggest and strongest ever. I, I could not do that. So after following low carb and ketogenic diet for a couple years, uh, I could literally do three times my body weight for reps and I had not been able to do that previously. So I think that's my power to weight ratio increased pretty significantly and I could do more chin-ups and push-ups and things like that with my body weight. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious as well, you know, uh, Thomas, you mentioned, you know, when you have these sessions or these, these times when you don't, you know, you cycle out of ketosis, right? I think a lot of people when they're like either a power or strength or like a CrossFit athlete, they're concerned with kind of committing to something and not being able to ever turn back, so to speak. And so I'm curious, how do you think about adding carbs back into your diet or kind of whether you're either in a competition, either from, for performance gains or, or it's just like you, you feel like you need a break from keto for a little bit. Like, can you kind of speak to that? Yeah, I think the most important thing to note is that you know, when someone goes back carbs, or I can speak for myself, when I go back carbs, like never do I go into like hardcore carb eater like I was before. Like it's not nothing like that. And I think that, that people might get confused sometimes when I talk about cycling like mildly out of ketosis. You know, it might imply that I'm consuming 400 grams of carbohydrates and completely just abolishing everything. Um, it's very gentle, very gradual. Mm -hmm. And it's very feel based. Um, so for me, it's usually a slow indoctrination, you know, usually adding uh, 10, 20 percent more carbs each day for about a week until I feel OK. And then I kind of reach a point where uh, I usually gauge my water retention quite a bit. That's a big thing for me. I can see like if I if I start to hold subcutaneous water for me, I'm going too far. You know, maybe that's a, a shallow way of looking at it from a body composition perspective, but it's a good barometer for me. Like I start to find like, it, that's like my tolerance. I, I tend to find, and there may or may not be research to back this up, that if I am having too many carbs, it shows in my why water retention subcutaneously. So I tend to back it off. And that's usually just tells me a good number. So yeah, I mean, very seldom do I go over, you know, 120, you know, and it's like, occasionally I will, I don't feel that great because I don't think I'm like that tolerant of it. Mm -hmm. But I definitely try to compensate 
with a little more fasting when I do add the carbs in, just because I still like to maintain that fat ad uh, adaptation. So like when I have more carbs, I'll try to back off the frequency of eating so that I am still ensuring good fat adaptation and, and you know, ketone production during that fasting period. So I'm not you know, losing that benefit. Now, I guess I'd really lose it, but I don't want to lose it. I really like that effect. Um, and then I tend to change my training. I definitely increase my volume. So uh, when I'm on carbs, and I, a lot of it, that's one thing where I do feel it. I feel like, I don't feel like my performance declines when I'm on keto uh, with lifting and with like CrossFit style workouts, but I do feel like my stamina for a CrossFit style workout goes down. So like I feel like with, when I'm on carbs, I might be able to handle a Metcon style workout for 40 minutes. Sure. When I'm on keto, maybe it's 30, you yeah. know, so it's subtle, but I definitely, that's where I do notice it. So I try to just, my goal is to just optimize for whatever nutritional kind of avenue I'm in. So like if, if I'm eating a lot of carbs, then what can I do better with carbs that I can't do with keto? And I'm going to lean into that because I really want to be good at a lot of things. Yeah. And then with keto, it's like, what do I, what am I good at when I'm in keto? I'm good at my endurance stuff and I'm good at like more, um, you know, high volume training, like in terms of uh, just regular resistance training, and I, I do that and I lean into it. And that's how I try to get the best of all worlds. Yeah. It's like, because no matter what, you're probably gonna find situations where under some circumstances, you do better with carbs. Yeah. I don't know what circumstances those are, but everyone's going to have, I feel better with X on carbs, I feel better with Y on keto. That's cool, lean into that, optimize for all of it, get good at all of it. Yeah. So I think that's my, my general kind of rule there. And if you're not getting better at something, with the carbs, then really question if they really need to be there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some people might flame me for saying that, but I mean, if you're not getting extra benefit from them, well, why? <laughs> like, you know, I've always said, I'm gonna, it sounds kind of funny, but you know, I say it on YouTube, but I mean, I, I would, if eating a dog turd that was on the table would make me perform better, I'd probably eat the dog turd. So like, I'm really like, I'm not like pro anything, I'm pro like, performance, results. pro yeah. results. Yeah. And I will tell you after 12 years, like, I've gotten the most results with keto and intermittent fasting, period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, that makes sense. Dom, do you have, do you have a similar, th how, how, how do your thoughts defer or compare? Yeah, I mean, I agree with everything there. And protein is key, like mm -hmm. keeping that protein pretty high yeah. to moderate, especially under periods of intense training, uh, maybe getting a little bit of the calorie surplus in and around days of intense training. Um, Yesterday, Thomas came in, he was sleep deprived, he had zero carbs. Uh, we trained and then we pushed a thousand pound hay bale a couple hundred yards and he was zero carbs and you were, I mean, we were going at it. I mean, we were a little fatigued, but I was actually thinking during that, that this is way more volume than I typically do. And what would happen if I was like to sip on, you know, 20, 30 grams of carbs. I think mm. yesterday in that context, you know, adding, trickling a little bit of carbs into the system may have given us a second wind. I was winded, you probably saw I was winded. And uh, I think we were both huffing and puffing, although I was huffing and puffing more, uh, pushing that bail. But I, but I think in that context, which is outside of the range of volume and intensity that I typically do, uh, a little bit of carbs could have helped. You know, so I don't know what you were thinking. Good point on that. Maybe it's like that was a different kind of workout. Yeah, just pushing that thing because you're using every muscle in your body. You know, it's not like it was. I mean, we did it what, over 15, 20 minutes or something. It wasn't like super long. But full was, body. It yeah. was full, full body. Yeah. Well, I mean, what's interesting to me is that like when we're talking about this, a lot of people have this idea of like keto or nothing. You know, and it's yeah. keto or bust. But like you're talking about adding carbs and intra-workout but it's only yeah. you're only really talking you know 10 20 30 grams you're not and, and you yeah, you know yeah. for a whole day 120 grams of carbs so it's sort of like you know if if keto per se you know the 20 to 50 grams a day may not quote unquote work for you like you know you can you can maybe titrate it up it sounds like you know in relatively smaller increments rather than tossing mm -hmm. the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak yeah. yeah and people are worried about you know, stopping all fat loss, you know, associated with a workout mm -hmm. when they take a little bit of carbs. But, you know, that's primarily mediated by insulin. And I think when you're working out, that's actually could be the optimal time to take in some carbohydrates because mm -hmm. you're facilitating non-insulin dependent glucose disposal mm -hmm. just by contracting your muscles. You can, you know, you're uh, facilitating glucose transport into the muscles and you're starting, you know, 
uh, getting a jump start on glycogen replenishment. So if you are going to incorporate carbohydrates into your protocol and you're doing a longer than normal workout or say just your workouts are longer, it might be good to introduce the carbs into your workout and that could also carbs given intra workout probably have a pretty significant anti catabolic effect and maybe an anabolic effect too but it doesn't have to be 60 80 100 grams of carbs i think just you know 20 or 30 grams of carbs and you don't have to get fancy i mean you could have like chocolate bar or something like or a little bit of honey or whatever bar, so, fancy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like a little. yeah so uh so I, did, I don't i think a little bit can go a long way so mm -hmm. uh the idea of introducing if you're going to have incorporate carbohydrates into your diet uh, uh, injecting them into your workout, uh, intra workout, is a way to basically force them into the muscles independent of insulin. So you could administer carbohydrates and you'll have less of an insulin response. And you're probably, uh, it's probably having no effect at reducing fatty acid oxidation while you're intense training during that time. So that could be a really good time, you know, if you're concerned about carbohydrates you know impairing your fat loss results i think and you want to you have an allocated amount of carbs that you're going to incorporate throughout the day uh incorporating them into workout where you have non-insulin dependent glucose disposal could be an idea how long is that window is that just the workout itself or can it or does it extend at all post workout yeah. While you're training, while the muscle is contracting, you're facilitating, yeah, glucose disposal. So uh, you can see it pretty much, you know, on a CGM. But you yeah. wouldn't consider that for like a post-workout um, type of thing. You're not kind of using that same different pathway. Different pathway. Yeah, yeah, different. And post-workout, I think what's really important is like you know protein, amino acids, getting it and probably not going probably backing off a little bit on the fat too yeah. i don't know what your thoughts are yeah. on that too. you know it, yeah i definitely yeah. think that backing off on the fats because i mean you're just slowing the carbohydrate absorption yeah, yeah but i also you know this is an entire so there is this uh what was it called it was really interesting stuff it was it was called uh metabolic gridlock have you heard of that before no yeah. so this was i can't remember the paper it's like where it's like mitochondria actually do prefer like one fuel at a time like in an ideal circumstance mm -hmm. now so it was like it was kind of interesting now this was in vitro stuff so i mean who knows but it was like it, it always had me kind of thinking like i would rather like very much so like give my body protein and carbs or protein and fat like yeah. i don't really like want to like combine them and a lot of it came from a little bit of a a incorrect preconceived notion that I used to have. I used to, I used to think, so some of it's placebo effect, I think, that you know, if you spike your insulin along with, carbohyd with carbohydrates, but you also have fat in the equation, that the fat would shuttle into the cell too. And I think that's, it might be partially true. Is, it, is that true? Like if you spike your insulin and have fat come in the equation at, at the same time, will the fat shuttle in like along for the ride? You know, I actually like fat load at night, I guess you could say. So I think of like my adipose, you know, tissue as little bags that they're releasing fat during the day. And then I'm eating fat during the night and, and putting fat back in. But it's that fat flux. So when you're on a ketogenic diet, you have tons of fat going out and you also have tons of fat going in if you have a calorie surplus. And that's okay, right? And then you create a calorie surplus and the net effect is a smaller adip adipocyte. You know, and uh, but in the context of, I guess, maybe what you're talking about, I think getting in post workout, I would back off on my fats in the morning. I tend to get a lot of fats throughout the day and be fat fueled to facilitate fat fuel throughout the day and not not a whole lot of protein. But at nighttime or especially uh, if I train usually late afternoon. Uh, just getting a lot of protein. And I noticed that the protein probably does kick in insulin a little bit because my glucose goes down. And I think you noticed that too. I mean, when you came over our house, it, we ate a pound and a half of meat and I showed you my CGM and it actually went down. Like I didn't have any rise at all. And, and I think that was probably due in part to some of the amino, amino acids kicking in uh you know obviously you're metabolizing a ton of, of protein and some of some of it is can converted to glucose but because that protein caused a little bit of an insulin rise my the net effect on my glucose was a lowering of glucose and i think you mentioned seeing that too yeah I've definitely seen and this. with fat uh, I think fat may be impairing that a little bit because sometimes I see a glucose rise if I have a fatty keto meal. So I tend to do uh, post-workout. So I tend to just really focus on the protein yeah. after the workout. Notice that too. And 
Yeah, it's kind of interesting, especially, uh, definitely it depends for me the time of day that I train as well. Yeah. Um, as uh, you might be familiar with the yeah. BMC medical genomics study that was like, uh, basically, I mean, you have more fuel accumulation genes in the evening time than you do in the morning. And that's kind of where a lot of the whole like breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, dinner like a popper, like kind of like higher calories yeah. in the morning. And, 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 so I tend to like really ingrain that in my mind, and that's for lots of reasons. But if I'm training in the afternoon, uh, yeah. my post workout is like lean, clean protein, and that's it. If I'm training in the morning, uh, I'll go heavier on the protein, might even add some carbs in, and then 30 minutes later, I'll bring the fats in. So I have no yeah. problem like stacking my calories higher if I'm training in the morning. But if I'm training in the evening, I don't want to fall victim to getting in the habit of eating copious amounts of you know eating. 1,500 calories or something in the evening, yeah. uh, like I have done a couple times on this trip. <laughs> well, I tend to do that, you know, if I don't do that, I lose weight. So yeah. at nighttime, typically I have like uh, a cup and a half or so of, of sour cream and I put some cinnamon in there. I might put a little bit of protein powder uh, and then I put blueberries in there too, wild blueberries. But I do like fat loading at night and if I... If I'm traveling, sometimes I don't do that and I, I come back and I've lost a couple pounds. So for me, you know, a lot of guys talk about carb backloading. Uh, I'll work out, get a high protein, and then a couple hours will pass. And I do eat kind of later at night around 9 o'clock, maybe go to bed at, at 11 o'clock. So I try to distance it about two hours. But I do get quite a bit of fat during, during the night. And, and also the majority of my carbs also are at nighttime. I feel it helps me sleep a little bit better. Do you find that this is kind of uh, personal interest? Like glycerol is uh, actually can be like I used to use it when I was lifting. I would take some glycerol because it would give me a tremendous pump, right? Yep. Yep. Um, so is that is there a theory like that by pounding more fats, you actually in a ketogenic diet could give yourself a better muscle pump and drive more of that intracellular volume with that? Or is dietary like glycerol backbone different than taking straight like now foods glycerol and pounding a couple tablespoons of it? It's really interesting you bring that up because I think if you fat load, if you've dieted down and you're especially in a really good shape and then you eat a lot of fat and sodium, you expand plasma volume. You could feel like you become more vascular yeah. and things start shooting out. Um, and I think that glycerol will pull water in with it. So if you have a lot of glycerol in circulation, either from drinking glycerol you can get at the drugstore, or if you were breaking down a lot of triglycerides and liberating the glycerol backbone, that glycerol is in circulation and it pulls water in with it and expands plasma exactly. volume. Uh, and if you add a little sodium in there too, I mean, your, your vascularity and your pump can, can really jump out. I've noticed that. So, which, which can uh, have a performance and disadvantage I, sometimes, but... Maybe. I, I've talked about this with different people because certain fitness athletes will use that prior to stage and things like yeah. that. And I've talked about this with different people, and, but it's never been characterized in the literature yeah. you know, as something that's happening. Although glycerol is, but increasing like fat loading as a means to increase glycerol in circulation and that actually causing an expansion in plasma volume just by glycerol pulling in more water. I don't, I'm not, thir I'm not no, sure that's accepted, but I'm pretty sure it's happening. I did a video on uh, like Val Valentina Shevchenko, you know, UFC f a flyweight champion, and her like, she, like she trains dehydrated. And she didn't really know why, so I did a video breaking mm -hmm. down like, it's a, it's a big Slovak thing, they're really big into it. And there's a lot of methodology behind it when you train uh, dehydrated, it increases uh, plasma volume uh, yeah, yeah. because it just has to do with uh, a heat response and, and dehydration and basically trying to basically consolidate water and yeah so and that's a potentially for multiple avenues is a performance enhancer because increase like you said but also um, kidneys and EPO and everything like that too so yeah. very interesting like world that I'm like trying to there's just not a lot of literature in it like that whole thing yeah. is like very nebulous very so I mean it's careful talking about it but in the world of performance and myself anecdotally I mess around with these things. Like I've tried yeah. trading dehydrated to kind of mess with it. I'm like, wow, I actually do perform really well. Do, do you perform better during the actual, like that session? Or you're saying like- you, No, it's that training? session, very much that session. Okay. I do not recommend being chronically dehydrated. Sure. <laughs> well, no, of course. But I was just thinking like, does the, the dehydration during the session actually improve the later sessions, i.e. it trains? Oh. You know what I mean? That, that's a good question. That I have not measured, but I played around with it and aerobically, uh, I seem to be better off if I just have a small amount of water 
rather than, you know, and a lot of these, there's a lot of UFC fighters that talk about this, and I think maybe it gets ingrained in their brains uh, simply because they're so used to cutting weight and stuff like that. So maybe totally. it's just a simple stream of consciousness that they just go that route. It's yeah. just, it's something that I really do think needs more research. It's really cool. Yeah. You're increasing aldosterone, and that has a, uh, uh, a sodium and water sparing effect. So I think you're, in part, you know, that's kind of like a stress response, but that you are, like when some people are under stress, they retain water. I think that's part of it. I have always done, like I'll take some electrolytes, either they're like keto starch is like a gram of sodium or element uh, electrolytes with water prior to working out. And I notice, and I usually throw in some creatine too to facilitate that. So my approach has been to sort of hyperhydrate, but take in sodium and sort of hyperhydrate before water because I'm getting off work, I'm drinking coffee all day, I'm keto, I'm usually coming home from work dehydrated mm -hmm. so when i get that fluid and electrolytes in i can, I can kind of feel it yeah. pretty quick and that that's that's my joints sort of too approach. yeah mm -hmm. i imagine as well like if you're a fighter one of the other reasons why you do that is, is simply because like in a round like I, I i have a bit of a wrestling background and during the actual match like you get cotton mouth and you just yeah, you just yeah. are totally dehydrated and so practicing sure. being in that, in that state is is from an, like a mental standpoint likely quite mm. quite advantageous yeah. Yeah. that definitely makes a lot of sense and i think that it started raising all kinds of questions in my mind about plasma volume being dehydrated and like ketogenic dieting being in a kind of dehydrated state a lot of times, are there performance benefits that are actually coming outside of just what we're looking at with keto? Like, That's a good question. Are we mildly dehydrated and we're actually getting a possible hormetic stressor from that? Are we, That's I mean, it's question. again, all these things that I just, are not safe for me to say, yes, this is the way, but it's the things that bounce around in my gray matter since I've been, you know, I think about this stuff constantly, but we'll leave that for another day or someone else to fund some research on. <laughs> <laughs> There's also greater metabolic water production uh, that happens when you're breaking down fats. That too. makes sense. So, yeah, so yeah, you're that you are actually producing water, you know, some will argue, there's various calculations, 100 milliliters, if you're really oxidizing a lot of fat, it could be up to two or 300, even upwards of like 400 milliliters of water that you're making. Really, and yeah, that's predominantly yeah. being pulled from like the hydrogen in the fat, in the fat yep. right? That's so right. your, your yep. fat is making water. Yep. yep. Really, is your fat and crying? It's deuterium depleted water, <laughs> which some, um, if you if we reduce the amount of deuterium, you know, if we're oxidizing uh, good fat sources and we're making metabolic water, that water is depleted in deuterium, and in theory. That water is being produced within the mitochondria and its close proximity uh, to the nucleus, and it could promote genomic stability and actually enhancement of you know cellular processes and signaling. Wow. So there's a whole uh, a whole science of deuterium depleted water that you can drink deuterium depleted water. That's a whole industry, mm -hmm. but the best way to promote you know, deuterium depletion is actually through metabolic water production, which is just oxidizing more fat. And, you know, you make more metabolic water. So it's a whole nother, very interesting topic. Dr. Laszlo Boros is, is awesome. sort of a leader okay. in, that, in that field. Yeah. Really quick question, because I know we want to wrap up soon, <laughs> but um, in terms of pre-workout, yep. can we talk about either MCTs or BHBs or just sort of, you know, stances on, you mm -hmm. had mentioned as well, inter-workout uh, uh, carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I almost invariably train fasted uh, with the, so just speaking for myself, so, uh, but I'm also a fan of occasionally training under mild glucose, you know, amounts before and intra. And that's just simply because if I'm going to try to maintain some glucose tolerance, meaning reminding my cells that, hey, it's still okay to use glucose as a fuel during this workout, you know, I find that like I want to do it. Uh, just a small amount before an intra, just so that I'm like almost cramming glucose into the cell and like force feeding it, for lack of a better way of saying it, to really condition it to still use that glucose. Um, but uh, MCTs, uh, yeah, I've definitely used MCTs pre-workout. As long as you can handle the GI uh, potential distress there, mm -hmm. heck yeah. So some people talk about growth hormone in terms mm -hmm. of when you're in a, a facet state, you know, seeing, hey, that's risen as of however many hours 12, 16 or so. So do you, do you feel like that's at all, should be part of the equation when, when determining whether or not you want to uh, work out fasted or do you feel like, like it's a negligible effect? If, 
Oh, it's I feel it's negligible. Yeah, I, say, I don't I think there's any too. ergogenic benefit to the fasting-induced GH release, mm-hmm. personally. Yeah. Uh, it may. I mean, if you do it day in and day out. And, uh, but I don't, yeah, the, I don't think there's any the, major advantage. There. One study is 2,000% increase in growth hormone. I think people take that to the bank a little too much. Yeah. That's not the way it totally. is. I say uh, one thing that I do for growth hormone response that is very well documented is uh, sauna usage. Saunas, mm-hmm. there is a lot of documents. So I, whenever possible, hit a high heat sauna post workout. And I think that lengthens the pulse a little bit more, but more so it helps the evening pulses later on, which are the ones that I think really matter. So, um, but I'm not an expert in that. So. Huge benefit. To, I mean, we, we were talking about Rhonda Patrick has yeah. put out a ton of information. There's a lot of good literature coming out on sauna yeah. that is uh, that I was not aware of. So there's a lot of really good science on the benefits of sauna. Without so, a doubt. Yeah. So. And I know we could easily do a part two, three, four, ten of this, but probably got to wrap it up because speaking of food, we need to go eat. So. Um, Dom, as always, yeah. man. Thank you. It's great having and you here. Yeah. Connor, as always, Thank man. you. Great to see and you again. Connor. Keep it locked in here on my channel. If you have ideas for future videos with Dom, Rhonda Patrick, any, any of these kind of people in this metabolic circle, um, by all means, put them down below, and I'll see you tomorrow.